The Spy Who Dumped Me has been getting a lot of buzz the past few weeks, and it finally hits theaters this Friday. Now, I admit that I have a soft spot for movies where normal, everyday people get mixed up in high-stakes espionage action. Yes, it's been done before, like in True Lies, Enemy of the State, The 39 Steps, Red, Red 2, Spy, Gotcha, Sneakers, Charade, Keeping Up with the Joneses, North by Northwest, The Man with One Red Shoe, The Man Who Knew Too Much, The Man Who Knew Too Little, and a few dozen others. But there's always room for more. So for this week's episode, I'm going to find the connections between some classic movies about spies and people who are operating undercover. And I promise they won't all be James Bond movies, though there are a couple. I mean, really, it'd be impossible not to include James Bond in this. And I'm going to start and end the chain with The Spy Who Dumped Me. So here's a tease of what's to come. The Spy Who Dumped Me tells the story of Audrey, played by Mila Kunis, and her best friend Morgan, played by Kate McKinnon, who get entangled in an international conspiracy when Audrey discovers the boyfriend who just dumped her was actually a spy. Now, the title of the movie is, of course, a reference to the 1977 James Bond movie, The Spy Who Loved Me. That film marked Roger Moore's third time playing 007, and was his personal favorite in the series. Now, fans remember it for having a great theme song by Carly Simon, and for it being the debut appearance of one of the best Bond henchmen ever, Jaws, played by Richard Keel. And, of course, it was loaded with some great Bond gadgets, including a ski suit with a built-in Union Jack parachute, and a Lotus Esprit that could convert into a missile-firing submarine. And if you've seen Kingsman The Golden Circle, those gadgets might ring some bells. First, when Eggsy and Whiskey are sliding down the mountain in a runaway ski gondola, Eggsy activates Whiskey's parachute to stop them. Instead of the Union Jack, though, this time we see the stars and stripes. And when Eggsy is chased by agents of the Golden Circle and the London police, he ultimately escapes by driving his cab into a lake, where the cab also converts into a submarine. Two key members of the Kingsman are Eggsy's mentor, Harry Hart, and Merlin, who is essentially the cue for the Kingsman. These roles are played by Colin Firth and Mark Strong, who both appear together as spies in another film, 2011's Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Both are involved in the search for a Soviet mole within British intelligence, and during the investigation we see a flashback to an office Christmas party where Strong and Firth spend the moment talking with each other. In the background, you can hear a song playing. It's the second best secret agent in the whole wide world by Sammy Davis Jr. The song is the theme song from a 1965 spy comedy released in England as License to Kill, but distributed internationally as the second best secret agent in the whole wide world. The plot focuses on a Swedish scientist who has invented an anti-gravity device that he wants to deliver to the British. With James Bond unavailable, Agent Charles Vine is given the assignment to protect the scientist and his daughter and to bring them safely to the UK. The head of the organization tasked with capturing or killing the scientist is played by Peter Bull. Peter Bull is a familiar face to classic film fans, who are likely to remember him for his roles in The African Queen, and notably as the Russian ambassador and spy in Dr. Strangelove. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the war room! One of Peter Bull's first roles in movies was in 1936, when he played one of the conspirators who recognizes a Scotland Yard detective in Hitchcock's Sabotage. There's a scene in Sabotage where one of the conspirators sends his wife's brother, Stevie, to deliver some film reels and, unknowingly, a bomb to Piccadilly Circus. Running late, Stevie hops on a bus where the conductor stops him to tell him he can't bring film reels on a bus because the film is dangerously flammable. Hey, you can't bring those there in a public vehicle. They're films, ain't they? Yes. Then they're flammable. Go on off, off, big boy. But I've got to get to Piccadilly. Can't I leave my mouth on the platform or somewhere? This scene reappeared more than 60 years later in another movie, when Quentin Tarantino used it in Inglorious Bastards to explain to modern audiences how dangerous nitrate film could be. At that time, 
35 millimeter nitrate film was so flammable that you couldn't even bring a reel onto a streetcar. Here, you can't bring those there in a public vehicle. They're films, ain't they? Yes. Then they're flammable. Go on up off. Because nitrate film burns three times faster than paper. Inglorious Bastards is such a watchable movie for me because it has these great simple moments that have a huge impact on the story. The best example of this is the tavern scene where the Gestapo officer is speaking with the Bastards. They're undercover as Nazi officers meeting with their contact, film star Bridget von Hammersmark. Now, the Gestapo major, already suspicious of the group because of their accents, offers to buy a round of scotch for the table. And as they're determining how many clean glasses they'll need, Lieutenant Hickox raises his hand to order three glasses. In that moment, the Gestapo officer knows that these men are not who they say they are. And after shootout, Van Hammersmark explains why. How does shooting start? Englishmen give themselves away. How do you do that? He ordered three glasses. We order three glasses. That's the German three. The other looks odd. A slip-up like this has been the downfall of other film characters operating undercover. Another great example is in The Great Escape. Richard Attenborough and Gordon Jackson are just about to get on a bus that will take them outside of the search perimeter. They get stopped and are briefly questioned in German and in French, and just as they're getting onto the bus, they make a fatal mistake. Good luck. Thank you. Now, one of the most iconic scenes in The Great Escape was Steve McQueen riding a stolen motorcycle while being chased by a German patrol. Elements of that scene, right down to using the same model of a Matisse Desert Racer motorcycle, were repeated in The Man from Uncle. The original television series and the 2015 movie The Man from Uncle both referred pretty directly to James Bond. In fact, Bond's creator Ian Fleming helped develop the original television series and suggested the name Napoleon Solo for the name of the American agent. Fleming had created a similarly named character as one of the three mafia bosses in Goldfinger. The movie version of The Man from U.N.C.L.E. references these ties to Fleming and to Bond by placing Army Hammer's character in Room 707 and by a scene where Solo talks about a recent run-in Ilya had with a Count Lippi. Apparently, you put someone called Count Lippi in hospital. He had soft bones. And don't question my methods. Count Lippi was an enforcer for Spectre featured in Thunderball. Lippi oversaw the scheme to replace an RAF pilot with one of his own men so they could hijack a bomber and an atomic bomb. When the plan goes poorly, Spectre decides to eliminate Lippi by having assassin Fiona Volpe blow up his car during a chase sequence. Thunderball has the unique distinction of being the only Bond film to be remade. Almost 20 years after the original was released, Sean Connery played the part of James Bond again in the remake, Never Say Never Again. While nowhere near the top of anyone's list of favorite Bond movies, Never Say Never Again does have the distinction of being the debut film performance of Rowan Atkinson. Atkinson played Nigel Smallfawcett, a bumbling and inept representative of the Foreign Office in the Bahamas. He provides much of the comic relief in Never Say Never Again, playing a role very similar to the one he would play years later in the series of Johnny English movies. The second film in that series, Johnny English Reborn, references a number of James Bond movies, including From Russia With Love, Die Another Day, and Quantum of Solace. It also introduced a new head of MI7 overseeing Johnny's mission. That role was played by Gillian Anderson. And guess what new movie features Gillian Anderson as the head of British intelligence? It's The Spy Who Dumped Me. That is the Beyonce of the government. So let's review the connections we've covered today. We started with The Spy Who Dumped Me, which is a spoof on the title of the James Bond movie, The Spy Who Loved Me, which features Bond deploying a parachute that had a flag on it and driving a car that can convert into a submarine, both of which were repeated in Kingsman, The Golden Circle which stars Colin Firth and Mark Strong as British agents, roles similar to ones they played in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. 
which featured a party scene where you can hear the theme song from the second best secret agent in the whole wide world, which starred Peter Bull as the head of the team out to capture a Swedish scientist. Peter Bull played a conspirator in Hitchcock's Sabotage, and Tarantino took a clip from that movie and used it in Inglorious Bastards, which had a pivotal scene where an undercover soldier makes the wrong hand gesture that was similar to the slip-up made in The Great Escape, which featured a motorcycle chase repeated in The Man from U.N.C.L.E., which had a character with the same name as a character in Thunderball, a movie remade as Never Say Never Again, which was the film debut of Rowan Atkinson who played a similar character in Johnny English and Johnny English Reborn, which features Gillian Anderson as the head of the British intelligence, a role she repeats in her new movie, The Spy Who Dumped Me. And we've come full circle. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little tour. If you have a favorite movie star, a specific film, or even a type of movie you think would make a good episode, please be sure to let me know in the comments below. And until next time, thanks again for watching A Million Movies.